Hello. Thank you guys so much for coming. This is um, really, oh my god, this is really, really special for me. I am going to make a confession to Lori on this stage today. I'm going to confess something. Lori, when I was a sophomore in high school, because I was obsessed with your book, <laughs> Another girl in my English class offered to pay me to write her book report on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. <laughs> but I did such a good job that then she read the book and wrote it herself. Because <laughs> um, she was really into it. She read the report and she said, oh man, I'm missing out. And she was right. It's an amazing book, 20 years later, sitting on this stage with you, is wild. But also, I'm incredibly grateful for the words you wrote then and how they affected me then, how they continue to affect young women today. You're amazing, and I just think you need to accept that for just a minute. Feel that. Okay. Feel that. Okay. All right. Now we're going to stop that again. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm going to ask her some questions, and then we're going to let you ask some questions. But until then, the only thing I ask is that you um, not do flash photography, only because it'll distract me, and I'll start to stutter and cry. It's really ugly. <laughs> you don't want to see that. So it's more of a warning yeah. uh, than anything else. So first of all, why do you think, 20 years later, Speak still resonates with so many young people? Well, first of all, I, I need to thank you, since you, know, you didn't give me a minute there, but <laughs> because um, Ashley is one of these, uh, it's just I'm so blessed that I'm alive long enough to watch the next generation rising up. Um, and, and it's just so encouraging and it gives me such hope to see the talent and the heart and the integrity of young writers like you. Um, you're changing our world. And so it was such an honor to have your voice and Jason's voice, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the covers with me. I feel like the book, now I'm, I'm like, I'm with my friends now in the book. Um, uh, and that's a piece of maybe why the story still is resonating. Because the truth is we treat our teenagers atrociously in this culture. We fail our kids every day. It's even those of us who think we're doing it right because we love our kids and we're trying the best, but when we're trying to do the best by our children in a culture that is designed to not care about them except as consumers, um, and you know we have this giant maw of, a, 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 of the American business uh, model that's designed not to care for souls or to nurture hearts or to help children find the best in the world, it, 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 it's designed designed to not to destroy them because they need their bodies to to make money and and buy their shit um, but at the t and, and the way that we've set up publication uh, not publication um, education the way it's designed in the it's almost designed deliberately to break the spirits of kids we take kids at the time when they most need to develop connections with other trustworthy adults other than their parents, right? Because they're beginning to you know, get ready to, to leave the nest. And we put them in buildings where they change classrooms every 45 minutes and never have the opportunity to develop lasting relationships with teachers who, for the most part, care deeply about them. So we fucked our kids over. Um, and it's not surprising that we have so many who are struggling with uh, issues of depression and anxiety and self-harming. Um, and because we don't talk to our children in a healthy way about human sexuality, we don't teach them about models of consent, um, that, just la that just sets them up again to be hurt or to hurt other people. Um, I often talk to teenagers about the grown-ups that make me the saddest. And everybody knows grown-ups like this. Everybody knows grown-ups who are really just kind of counting the days till the casket arrives. They're alive, their bodies are moving, they're going through the motions, but that spark in them died when they were teenagers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's why this this is a book that I I was trying to, and it seems like it worked, trying to be real about what it feels like to be alone and to be alone with pain that you don't know, you don't have the words for. Um, you don't, so you, you, you don't have the words to discuss your pain and you don't know how to go about connecting with somebody who might hold your hand a little bit. Um, my goal, and you can help me with this, mm -hmm. uh, and you can help us with this too, our goal is for when we do the 40th or the 50th anniversary of the book, we're gonna shift the needle. We're going to shift the needle to a place that it's never been in our culture, where we're talking about respect and compassion for everyone, right? Seeing everybody, who they are, where they are, um, and surrounding them with the right kind of love and support and books and education. Because when we do that, um, then we can put speak on the shelf. I love that. How does it feel to sort of hand Melinda over to your readers because in a way you do for a while when you're writing a book like this mm -hmm. that character is just yours mm -hmm. they're just yours to house and protect and torture and redeem and all of that and then you hand them over to an audience how do you feel about the way your audience has treated Melinda Wow, I never thought about it that way. Um, there's a piece of that sharing that, that, fe that is, uh, reminds me of when all of my kids went off to college. Equal parts terror and joy, um, and mostly terror. <laughs> um, but then you see them kind of making their way in the world, and you're like, yes, I'm so proud of you. Um, what I love about the way that what I love, one of the things, there's so much I love about the way re readers interact with this story. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that touches me the deepest is um, readers allow themselves to be vulnerable alongside Melinda. Um, they let their guard down. It's, and it's, that's so hard to do when you're a teenager because the world's been very busy making your life horrible. Um, but they let their guard down and they let her come in, which means that they're you know, that means that they're uh, opening themselves up to discovery and growth. And that's pretty cool. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> Would you change anything looking back 20 years? Because, you know, I'm in the process of writing my book right now. And I have to imagine in 20 years, I got to imagine the day after they're like, that's the final one. I'm going to be like, no, wait. <laughs> This is, um, this is like, I don't know how, how other authors feel about this, but I have a really hard time reading my books after they're published because I always want to change things. Um, however, if you have a really great editor, where it's Joy Peskin in the back, looking at Joy Peskin, right? Um, uh, then you're allowed to write the graphic novel version of your book. <laughs> and you can go back in and fix all that stuff that's been bothering you for a very long time. So in the graphic novel version of, of, of Speed, um, there were a couple scenes that after a lot of years I realized kind of had the same um, narrative beat, emotional beat, that I duplicated and, it, and, the, and the second instance didn't move the story forward. I was like, oh, I, but I can fix that now. And so I, I, I did a little bit of smoothing of rough edges and that felt really good. I read that version and I really liked it. Yeah. Um, I thought that, you know, and one of the things that I told you and at the time, um, because I interviewed you for PBS Books. Right, in for LA. the graphic. Yep. Um, and when that came out, you know, one of the things I told you and also the artist Emily. that you worked with, Emily, was that the way you guys executed certain scenes, and it's the same mm -hmm. in Speak, the way you execute certain scenes are, you know, meant to help the reader, or at least it feels so meant to help the reader understand what's happening and really connect to the moment and feel like the mm -hmm. fear and feel like they are with Melinda, mm -hmm. but at the same time sort of protects from re-traumatizing mm -hmm. if it's something you've experienced before. How, I mean, 
I wonder, you know, as peop as more and more people, as this new generation mm. writes about these tough subjects mm -hmm. and tries to do so in a way that minimizes harm, mm. um, how do you find that balance mm. of making sure you understand what's happening, you feel that fear, you feel that violence, but you don't have to feel like you are in danger as a reader? Wow. Boy, that's like, you could write a dissertation on that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I couldn't. I'm never going back <laughs> to school. Somebody in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe one of y'all will yeah. write a dissertation, yeah. not Ashley Ford. You know, one of the most interesting things of 20 years of a book is I'm hearing, I've been, and I've gotten so many wonderful messages on social media and privately, and, and people are just so, gosh, I'm like 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 that big. I, I'm still very much 15. I stopped de emotionally developing at 15, and so 15-year-old me is like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> it's like it makes me feel like the first time I ever went to kind of a, a grown-up party. It was in Washington D.C., and I was still in college, and they had um they had shrimp, a shrimp cocktail. Mm -hmm. It was like a buffet, and I'm like, I get to eat all that shrimp. <laughs> I feel like I'm eating all the shrimp right now. But I've heard a lot from readers who told me that they read the book in school, usually around ninth grade, and they liked it. Um, and then they read the book, like maybe like that summer between um, uh, high school and college. And then sadly, um, they were raped in college. And then they read the book again. Mm -hmm. And then they really got it. Um, and, I, and I think that that's important for us as writers and readers to understand that that intimate dance of reader and story sometimes changes the footwork, depending on where you are in your life, um, uh, how closely you can read it, uh, where you are with your emotional development. Um, so that, so I, I, I think that for me, I've had a couple of books that, you know, are, books that I lean into, I go back to, and then the n older me changes. And so that's why I think it's not, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about who my reader is. Mm -hmm. I know that my job is to tell the story that I feel I'm, I'm ready to tell. Mm -hmm. And if I do that well, it will respond to some readers out there. Right, right, I that like it was that, it's finding your people. Yeah. You know, so it's like the right people find it. Yeah, I yeah. think that's absolutely true. I think that's absolutely true. I, you know, I always tell um, when I teach people writing, mm -hmm. and they'll say stuff like, "Well, I have this idea, but it's too weird," or, you know, "I'm the only one who cares about this." And I always, you know, I'm like, "Who the hell do you think you are? You think you're the only person <laughs> in the world who cares about something? Yeah, yeah. You think you're the only person in the world who has had that experience? Yeah. There's no way." There's no way. It's like, no, you know, everybody, every human has human emotions. Every human has human emotions. And because of that, we can find each other and exactly. we can find the stories that, you know, fit the narratives we're looking for that yeah. inspire us or that make yeah. us feel whole. Now, one of the things that you said is that you go into a lot of schools. I do. To talk about. <laughs> <laughs> this book, which so doesn't many surprise me. So <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do they still have like that square pizza, like that rectangle oh, yeah. pizza? Oh, it's nasty. At the nasty. schools? Oh, man, I remember that rectangle. Do y'all remember uh, the rectangle uh, pizza? I don't know. I like because of where I'm from. I'm from Indiana, and I never know if we all get the same school lunch, <laughs> I think or if like people in New York were getting like caviar. No, no, no. Or, guaranteed they weren't getting caviar. Okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe not the schools that that I go to. Well, India, Indiana is also different in that. Like, I bet you guys probably had like some rule where you got a vegetable. There, are nobody. <laughs> like, there's that's not in Indiana. There's no, no rules. No. We we just farm them. We're not gonna right, eat them. Right, <laughs> what no. are we rabbits? <laughs> yeah. Um, just kidding. I live here now, guys. It's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do not have scurvy. Yeah. But <laughs> but um, when you go into schools, one of the things that I always think about is because this is a tough subject mm. and because, you know, there are a lot of conversations happening right now um, around school age um, people and consent. Yeah. 
and assault, that there's probably one of two things going on in the country right now. Either people are bringing you in to talk about the, your book, or they're banning your book. <laughs> which are two the opposite reactions <laughs> and I'm wondering like what how does that feel to have written something that in equal measure is being taught yeah. and banned well you know I, I, I try to look for bridges you know, when, when I come up against people who uh, don't see the world from the perspective that I see the world, um, uh, I, because I, 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 trust me, I can get as 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 furious and, and indignant, and I can do all that stompy rage thing, but in my experience, it doesn't move us very far. So I'm always trying to figure out. So what are the bridges I have with people I disagree with, especially people you know like who have called me a pornographer, for example, um, and banned my books. Um, what's interesting is that. If the book, look, look at what's provoking those two very different reactions. One, re, what, one reaction goes, wow, this is a, sexual violence um, and the, uh, the disrespect of people's bodies is a very, very important topic. We need to discuss it. Um, and then the people who want to ban it are saying, it's a really important, this is such a big, hairy topic. I don't know how to talk about it. Let's push it away. Chris Crutcher always says that when, um, when families or, pe or people in a community try to ban a book or remove it from the child's you know, opportunity to read it, what they're telling that kid is we can't talk about that. Um, and at the time in our lives, when we, their lives, when we want our kids to be really open. So for me, um, I think it tells me I'm on the right path, that I'm provoking those two very different reactions. And then the next piece is to say, OK, how do we continue conversations with people who are struggling to right. talk about this? Right. What, the thing that I always wonder about, especially, are how we're talking about these things with boys because quite often they are left out of the conversation completely. I know when I was in school, when we had the conversations about sex, when we had the conversations about anything like that in school, for the most part, the boys and girls were completely separated. Right? Like it was like, it was like, right? the, like what you're doing has nothing to do with each other yeah. until it has something to right, do with right, each other. Right. Like that is. Don't you want to know what also, they told the boys? I mean, we always did, but you know what we found out is that quite often while the boys um, got, at our school, this is so weird that I'm saying this right now, and also kind of weird that I remember it. At our school, the boys got the sex conversation earlier, and the girls just got the period right. conversation. Right, right. We didn't get the sex. It was like, mm -hmm. you're going to bleed. Mm -hmm. And the, for the boys, it was like, you're, you're not going to bleed. You're going to do something else. And that was it. Like, yeah, and that yeah. was the it whole. It was a body fluid discussion. It was a body fluid <laughs> you're all discussion. Be damp. <laughs> that was it. Take a shower. I mean, <laughs> and you know, and back then, then, you know, there's no accounting for things like, you know, what if I don't like boys? <laughs> like, what if that's not who I'm thinking about? Yes. Or what if, like, I'm sitting in a room with all girls, but I don't necessarily feel like I belong in this right. room. Precisely. You know, but you put me in this mm -hmm. room because of some stuff my parents told you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that's, mm -hmm. and nobody thought about those things mm -hmm. then. But now mm -hmm. that conversation is everywhere mm -hmm. thank goodness mm -hmm. it's happening slowly but, slowly but i always i still still see the conversation centered around what girls should do mm -hmm. and i'm just come on like it's 2019 so i wrote an op-ed um in time that came out on tuesday and look it up it's pretty good. Do your Googles. <laughs> and it looks at exactly that question because, and, and it, and it, and I, and it, one of the things that were my, my personal growth in the last 20 years, because I started in that place where we have to teach our girls how to protect themselves because that was a message that was handed to me. Um, and uh, lots of interactions in schools uh, with teenage boys, they, those, I've, if I know anything about adolescence, it's because of very generous teenagers who let this old lady ask them very personal questions. And they talked, they told me what was going on. And our boys, um, our, our, our boys, our girls, and people who identify outside of those very old fashioned descriptions, all of our kids need to be seen, um, listened to, uh, so that we can hear what they think they know 
right? And, and, and what have they absorbed? And then, you know, I'd, I'd love to see some classroom models and, and family and community, uh, faith community models about how do we then kind of open up the conversation about human sexuality in a sex positive way. Um, and a big part of that is communication. I always, I always tell kids, um, I, boy, I have so much fun when I get to talk to a thousand teenagers at a pop, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> here comes Auntie Lori. And, um, you know, saying if, if, if you can't ask your partner uh, when you're sober and you have clothes on and the lights are on, what you want in terms of a sexual interaction, if, that, if the concept of asking that question to your partner, sober and dressed and... Uh, you're like, I can't ask him that. Um, that's great. Your body's telling you that you're not ready to have that kind of sexual interaction with that person. If you can't talk about it, then you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, we have drugs now, better living through chemistry. You're going to be having sex for 80 years. It's awesome. Thank goodness. Right? <laughs> and when I say that, the principal always, this big white guy in the back of the room, all the blood drains out of his face. <laughs> <laughs> I had one principal pull a fire alarm to stop my presentation. <laughs> it was awesome. That's funny. That's funny. I did an interview the other day where somebody's publicity person was trying to break into the control room. Oh. Uh, I'm not going to say what happened. No? I'm just going to okay. say that that happened, and it was very, very interesting for mm. me. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> now, that just tickled me. Yeah. Um, one of the things, that, the reason why I wanted to ask about, you know, like, the boys is not just because you wrote that, but also because the, not just because you wrote that op-ed mm -hmm. that you guys should be Googling at some point, yeah. but also because you had Jason Reynolds yeah. write yeah. the afterword for this, yeah. and if there's one thing I know about Jason Reynolds and boys, it's because they love Jason yeah, Reynolds' they books. They Young boys love Jason Reynolds' work, and I just, uh, thinking about him writing that afterward for it was just amazing to me because it meant such a different audience I think yeah. than you know this book has traditionally the teachers usually handed this book to girls mm -hmm. and 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 you know what that's that's just sort of that old model where where we've made women um, responsible for the control of their bodies in a way that would not entice men. Therefore, if a man was enticed by your body and had a, a physical interaction with you that you didn't want, it's still your fault because like, you wore that skirt or whatever. And that's old, old patriarchal garbage. And we're moving from that, thank goodness. Um, and can we just have a moment and just hold Jason in our heart and bless him because he's an amazing human being he and is. such a talented writer and took time out of his ridiculous schedule yeah. to to write that afterwards and I'm so appreciative of that because in my interactions with boys in the last 20 years have come in one of two flavors you do have those empathic boys that you know who are just like awesome and sweet and they come to me privately to talk to because they, they have a girl a friend who's a girl who has been harmed uh, molested or abused or attacked and they want to help her right but most of the interactions I've had with teenage boys for two decades is boys and I love boys. I mean, a, a married one. And <laughs> I raised one. I have five and a half grandsons. So there's like a lot of testosterone about to enter my life. And, um, and they, they're so wonderful. They're so, boys have such, I love them. And boy, do we mess them up and screw them over. Hello, Gillette. That <laughs> ad, right? So, ha oh my, and I just like all these guys like having this <laughs> reaction to it. I'm like, oh honey, oh baby boy. <laughs> the world has, has torn you from yourself, from your soul. Um, and so boys, they'd say to me, I didn't understand why she was so upset. I have heard that thousands of times. They didn't understand. They, they say that the sex only took a couple minutes, right? He's 17. Um, <laughs> what's the big deal, right? What's, what's the big deal if I ask her to go, go down to me in the school bus? That's not gonna, that's gonna take half a minute, you know? Um, and they just, it, it, and like, at first, when I first started to hear that, I just wanted, I wanted to say, son, give me your mother's phone number because we need to have a conversation <laughs> right now. But you just start to bleed for them when you realize that, wow, they have been s handed such false messages. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that they are taught to objectify, well, first of all, they, you know, there's so little room given 
for people of either or any gender or, or identity to explore their own sexuality without full, you know, fixing into these boxes. So that's problem one. And then they're, they are cut, they are, the culture tries to cut them off from their whole range of emotion. Yeah. You know, this is something to be dominated, this is something to be hurt, this is something to conquer, um, which really makes having authentic relationships a challenge. And so I think for me, sort of, you know, this is my, my purpose is shifting a little bit. I think we've done a, the fact that we have the Me Too movement, shout out to Tarana Burke, 2006, mm -hmm. who started the Me Too movement, um, and the rest of the culture slowly came up to where she was, because she was way ahead of leading us to this moment. Mm -hmm. um, we are, I think, survivors of sexual violence are, have, are more comfortable now than ever speaking up. It's still hard, still hard, and there's a lot of people not believe, there's a lot of work to do, but we've had that watershed moment. And I think the next watershed moment I would love to see us all work towards is to figure out how do we adults, because none, no, but very few people, if anybody, in this room had parents who were comfortable enough to talk to them about human sexuality um, from the beginning, right? And you, obviously you change the way you talk about it depending on the developmental age of the child. Um, and they didn't have parents who did. I had a great, a great grandmother. My great grandfather never saw my great grandmother without her clothes on that poor man because she always changed into her nightgown in the closet this is why white people are so screwed up see yeah <laughs> i was about to say i don't know that life i come from a very naked family <laughs> oh no 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 yeah no it's like you know the no. night dress that goes all so no so. when i would come home from school i used to have to go in the house first if i brought a friend home <laughs> to be like, you wait out here. Let me come in the house real quick. Grandma? <laughs> Grandma, where you at? What she got on? Can, yeah. you, can you throw in a robe or something? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. See, so we come from all these different cultural experiences, we do. right? We do. Um, and so to get to the place, uh, we, we have to get there for our young men. Mm -hmm. they, they, uh, we owe it to them. We owe them. We owe. We owe ourselves. We. We just. We can do this. I. You know. We were talking in the car. Um, that. You know. Some people are so sad and depressed right now. And there's a lot to be sad and depressed about. But if you have the f good fortune that I have, which is to spend a lot of time communicating with teenagers. Um, and communicating with educators who are spending a lot of time with teenagers. Wow, that gives me such hope. Mm -hmm. That, because like, especially when I see kids who are struggling, right? Um, and I go to, into a school and a teacher will say, wow, well, blah, 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 this one, this one, this one. I said, did they show up to school today? If they showed up to school today, because they had a choice. Right. You get to 14, you can choose not to go. I didn't go for a long time. Um, if they show, they keep showing up because they keep on asking us to help them figure it out. Yeah. And we can, we can use that. We should be serving them in that moment. See, this is why we mess with you, because you see that in young people. And you know, I've always been a person who I felt like I looked at young people, I look at kids, and I, I understood what they were trying to do. Mm. Even if everybody else was frustrated, I felt like I could look at them and be like, yeah, that is frustrating, but don't you see what they were trying to do? Don't you th see what they were trying to say? It's not sophisticated like us because they haven't had as much practice doing this life thing as we have. That's all. So it makes me really, really excited that you've done so much work with organizations that don't just go into schools, but that help women with this issue in general. Mm -hmm. Organizations like RAIN. Mm -hmm. How did you end up working with RAIN? So RAIN is R-A-I-N-N, -N, uh, Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network. It is the largest um, uh, organization that, that supports survivors of sexual violence in the, in the US. They also try to educate the judiciary and the police uh, and policy changes. They are my favorite group in the world. They have anonymous hotlines, anonymous chat lines. They have a special anonymous hotline for members of the military. Um, and they, uh, they've been around for 25 years, a little, little bit before. Um, and so when I, when, when I started to go out to schools, kids would come to me and I had no tools, right? I'm always trying to find, um, you know, it's not, I'm not a, 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 a reporter, a mandated reporter. When a survivor comes up to me, I'm always looking for, a, you know, which, which, which adult do you trust in this building? Let's go talk to them, her. Um, and then I, they, Rain is the next one. But there's also a lot of other organizations 
options besides rain, um, although rain should be getting money from you, um, or mm -hmm. no, no, from your rich relatives, yes. um, because they really are doing the work of angels. Um, during the Kavanaugh hearings, um, they had a, like like people were working around the clock because so many people were coming out of the woodwork. There's also a new organization uh, called One in Six which is set up for men because the estimate is that one in six men or boys have had what they call unwanted sexual contact. Um, and so, uh, so, so and the, in the, if you look at the back of this new version of Speak, we have a lot of extra materials in there. One of them is a pretty detailed resource list. There's a special group for people who are deaf or hard of hearing um, to talk to them about you know, their spe specific needs uh, dealing with the trauma of sexual violence. So there's a lot of really really great places. I think, for me, Rain is kind of at the top. Um, it's an honor to work with them. It's an honor to see them uh, save and change lives. Uh, and they do save and change lives. I've known quite a few uh, women who have used their services and resources in an emergency or in an ongoing situation. Right, right. And th the work that they do, and I'm saying this because I want you guys to understand that the work they do is invaluable. Yeah. It is invaluable. So reading a book like this, I know quite often people end up feeling a little bit helpless. You start thinking, right. you know, okay, this is happening every day. Right. This is happening to people all the time. What can I do? What you can do is help be part of the solution. Right. Help people heal. Help people recover. That would actually, I wonder if we should, we should, a, a little project, you just gave me a great idea, which is I would love to see all of those classrooms around the country, college and high school and middle school who use this book, um, you know, take on, you know, find a way to help them develop um, some kind of uh, connection for the readers, for the mm -hmm. kids to RAIN, whether that's a fundraiser, awareness in their community, but the, I'd love to see all those educators partnering with them, partnering with them. And it also models for kids that when you go through trauma, there are people yes. there to help you. Yes. And we need to show them what that looks like. Yes, absolutely. What's next for you? What's next? Oh, I've got a new book coming out. <laughs> I've got that book. It actually just showed up. Have you up. got it? Yeah, I read it already. <laughs> I'm going to get you. The, the, they screwed up the, pa the line breaks in the arc. Did they? Yes. So the, uh, the, the right one's coming to your house. Don't. Um, no, I think I have the right one. I'm going to just be honest. Oh, you might? Okay. I think I do. All right. Yeah, so it's called Shout. Um, I was supposed to be writing a novel, and, and it was really sucky. And, um, and then as, as October of 2017, as, it, as the stuff hit the fan, um, I was just... I I've, I've been getting incandescently angry in my older age. It's just like, I feel sometimes like there's fire coming out of my hair. <laughs> People tend to cross the street, and it's a good thing. Um, but, but poetry started to drip in my head um, when, when everything happened. And I've always written poetry. My dad was a poet. And so I, I threw out that really bad novel, and I wrote Shout, which is um, it's memoir. It's, it's memoir, it's manifesto, and it's poetry. Mm -hmm. And it tells my story. Uh, it talks about a little bit about my family history, because I think in order to understand our own stuff you know helps if you understand like what were your parents dealing with mm -hmm. and so looking at my parents own uh, experiences with trauma why my family doesn't talk about anything right. um, and how that inf affected me after my assault and then you know how did I cr crawl out of the pit right. um, and then everything that I've some of the stories that I've learned on the roads from other people who've been through similar experiences so yeah it's really good. <laughs> it's really good. Like, she t is talking about it, and that's all great. But let me tell you, it's really, <laughs> really good. Like, I read it, and I was riveted, and I loved it. It's, it's like, a, for me, it was a mix between... Um, um, Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson, and um, you guys might know The Chronology of Water by Lydia Yuknovich, which is a different kind of memoir. But if you put those two, it was... Ooh, thank oh, you. It's so good. Thank you. I Get into it. it is basically what I'm saying. And now we're at the question wait, wait, portion. Wait, no, I've got one you more got project. one more thing? Yeah. So, oh, she's got one more thing to say. So and in 2020, so, that, so that, that's my book in a couple of weeks. Okay. Next year's book, probably the most important thing I've ever done in my entire life. I've written a Wonder Woman graphic novel. <gasps> what? 
Yeah. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. See, I'm glad it's you didn't tell, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me that. So what? And now for something completely different, right? That's amazing. It's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, I was writing Shout and Wonder Woman at the same time. What? Yeah, it was nuts. It oh, my was, God. It's been a good year. When can I have it? As soon as... Well, they're, they're drawing. They're making the pictures right now. Okay. Okay. Well, when they're done with the pictures... Okay. It's and, mine. Okay. I'll, I'll take it, it in PDF form. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> All right. We want to I go want to questions. It. Okay. Now we're going to get into some right. questions. I only have one rule for questions, which is that you actually ask a question. That's it. Okay, you know why. You guys have gone to these things before. You know what's up. Just ask a question. Cool? Deal? Deal. All right. Got somebody right there. Um, I'm wondering what other works of literature, especially for younger readers, do you feel are particularly brave, specifically when it comes to gender? Mm. Um, wow gender it's interesting I'm I'm not the right person to ask that question of because I'm one of those writers who um I don't I don't want to unconsciously borrow from other people so like I read a lot of nonfiction. um I, I I like when I'm in between projects I'll read a lot but I don't often come too close to my lane in my reading um, does that make any sense? I bet you she's got, a, do you have a lot of really great suggestions, Ashley? I have at least one. Tell me. Um, there is a book called If You Could Be Mine by Sarah Farazin. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And that book goes into issues of gender. It goes into issues of culture and nationality. Mm -hmm. It is in just a beautifully written book. Sarah Farazin is an amazing writer. Um, it's set in Iran. It's lovely. It's a lovely, lovely book. So that would be like, I would start there. Mm. And I think that there are a few more from there, but the ones I've read so far, I'm just gonna be honest, except for If You Could Be Mine, mm. I'm mm. not really super impressed. But If You Could Be Mine is amazing. So I'd go there. Yeah. Um, this is pretty dark, but um, I have a friend who was uh, raped ever since she was young, mm -hmm. um, but when we went to the police about it, the New York authorities wouldn't help her, so I was wondering if you had any advice. Um, one, of the, one of the resources that you can find on Rain web, Rain's website is specifically aimed at people like you who are trying to support and love someone who has been through this. And they have very good advice. Um, uh, I'm not a professional in, in, in these matters, so I will lean to their greater authority. Um, the most important thing you can do is to listen and to be there to listen and, and help your friend. Um, sometimes, you know, in the perfect world, uh, when anybody was hurt by another person, we would be able to trust the police, first of all, and then we would be able to go to them, and then there would be a process, and the bad guy would go to jail. That's the fantasy. Um, and sadly, we're, we're far away from that, even though I know a lot of you know, great cops, the system is broken. What's more important than the police is making sure she's safe. If she's still in the house with that person, then I would help her work with other responsible adults to get her out of that dangerous position that's first and foremost is to make sure that her body is physically safe um, and then to help her find the kind of support she needs and then let once she's on firmer ground emotionally and within her life she's got a roof over her head she's getting food you know she's getting care um, she's the one who should be uh, in charge of what happens in terms of should we push for an investigation? Do we need to go to a different police department? You know, who, who do we contact about this? But it has to start with her healing f a little bit first. Um, and you are an amazing human being for being there for this, this friend. You. So thank you for that. Well, he, they, we want everybody to hear it. Thanks. Oh. Thanks. Hi, um, I am one of those teachers and I have three sons. I've been teaching your book for 15 years, so thank you, it's helped a lot of my students out. Um, my question is more along the writing process. Sometimes I would imagine, I went to become an English teacher, so I wanted to be a writer, that it's like an amorphous thing that you're trying to give shape, and yeah. how do you begin to give it shape? Like, when do you know it's taking shape? Yeah, writing is so messy. 
um, when I when I was in community college, I paid for community college by working on a dairy farm in northern New York, and so I'm really good at shoveling. <laughs> stuff and um, <laughs> and it, it's it's really and I, with all love and respect to your profession I think we do ourselves as writers and our kids a little bit of a disservice by the way sort of we're forced to teach the writing met the process right and there's five steps and um, <laughs> That's bullshit. There's not. There's way more than. There's five like, eight, and and what's <laughs> fascinating is like like brainstorming for me goes on through the entire book. Mm -hmm. When I get to the end of a first draft, now I'm at the starting line. Now I'm beginning to understand. It's like getting to know a character is like getting to know a friend. I never know what's going to happen in my books before I write them. I don't know. I just have questions and I'm angry about something. Anger is such a good thing to write from. So energizing. Um, and I've got to, I write lots of, I throw out as much as I keep, but th that's the fun part. And that's what I'd love to, f I, I'm, I don't know how to explain this to younger people yet. I'm trying to figure it out. Explaining to them how exciting it is is to write a couple of pages. Okay, you're proud of yourself. I wrote four pages. But then you find those three lines in those four pages that make the hair on your arm stand up. And you're like, whoa. I'm a genius. Yeah. That's how yeah, it feels. Yeah. And then your editor looks at them and goes, well, okay, one line's good. Yeah. <laughs> right? But, but I, I think that one of the biggest things in our way is we have to give ourselves permission to be messy and to write stuff that's kind of sucky. That's, that's part of the process. Um, and I, because for me, I mean, maybe it's different for people who write like genre fiction or more formulaic fiction if they're like writing a, like an eight book series and they know the characters and that's a little bit more plot driven kind of stuff. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I love books like that. But when you're, when you're writing books that are more character driven than plot driven, I think that the writing of the book is as much an exploration for the writer as for the reader, which is why it's very confusing, and you want to give up, and you're not allowed, because we need that book. Chaos. Yes, it's just like teaching, right? <laughs> you know, somebody told me recently your most important emotional skill is also the skill you need most as a writer, which is resilience. Yeah. It's not that you get it right every time, or even most of the time, it's just that you don't stop doing it. Yep. And if you keep coming yep. back, eventually you're gonna get something. Yep. Who, who else? Okay. Um, firstly, thank you so much for being here and thank you for your work. Um, I was just curious, did you foresee your book becoming such a piece of advocacy for against sexual violence? I'm, I'm assuming that's a no. Was that at all a part of your intention before or during? I didn't see the book getting process? published. <laughs> I honestly didn't. It was rejected for the for the for the working writers in the audience. I still have the rejection letter that somebody wrote for Speak. I laminated it, and that person feels really dumb now. She's told me that. I've met her at conferences. Um, <laughs> big mistake. Um, but I'm not bitter. Um, but but and but I think. I, and I, first of all, we should always say when we're talking about writing, your mileage may vary because it's such a personal thing, right? And whenever you hear writers talk about that, be clear that what they say might not connect with you. It doesn't mean you're not a writer. It doesn't mean that they're, that they're like foolish. It just means that they didn't connect with you. Uh, for me, um, my job is to tell a great story in as few words as possible, preferably. And, and if I tell a great story and put it out into the world, I trust the universe that, that it, it will land or it won't. But my only job is to tell a great story. And then, so that's called being a writer. Being an author is if you put a book into the world and then there's a response and it opens doors and it creates the opportunity for connection and community and growth. The author side, and some people don't like to do this, so they just stay at home and write. But I like to do it, so I go out into the world and, and do some stuff, advocacy work, and try to you know, create a platform for some, for some things. Um, and that works for me. Um, what do you think? Uh, I don't know. I'm not an author yet. Oh, you so are an author. But I'm not actually technically. You know, I'm I'm a writer. You know, I'm working on my book, and that's amazing. 
but also, I mean, I don't go, anything I write, I don't think I write with the intention of it being for anything. I write everything to connect. You know, some people, I'm not the writer who could just write and put things in a drawer. I'm not the kind of writer who writes just to write. I write because I'm trying to talk to people. Mm -hmm. Like, that's mm -hmm. why I write. And so the response is a vital part of it for me. I don't really need the response to go one way or the other, you know, because like I said before, I just know that like, if I write a book that I like, somebody else is gonna like it. Mm. Yeah. Somebody, at least my mama. <laughs> you know, like at least my, and she's cool. You yeah. know, like she's not, she's an okay lady. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, she doesn't have terrible taste, so it can't be that. <laughs> no. But I'm just saying, like, it's, I, I don't write toward um, advocacy. I write because I know that, like, my story w is not just mine in a certain sense. Like, mm -hmm. the things the, the things that stand out to me along the way is, like, that is the thing that makes this story my story. They're not just my things. Mm. They're somebody else's things. Somebody else has experienced those things. In a lot of cases, somebody else experienced those things with me. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I guess I just always feel like I'm trying to tell a story and I know different people are going to find different points along that path to identify with because I did and I wished my God, my God, when I was 13 and 14 years mm -hmm. old, I wished that somebody would write about the experiences mm -hmm. that I'm writing about in my book, mm -hmm. you know, with mm -hmm. my father being incarcerated mm -hmm. and all this being, my father was incarcerated just so you guys know um, I, my book essentially is about growing up as a young woman my father being incarcerated um, and me being sexually assaulted and I'm having a very close relationship with my father via letters um, and then finding out that my father was incarcerated for sexual assault and that's sort of you know the meat of that thing. That's a lot. Um, and it's a lot, but it's also something a lot of kids have a parent in jail yep. or have had a parent in prison. Yep. A lot of kids. If mass incarceration is a problem in this country, do you think these people just don't have families? Yeah. Do you think these guys don't have kids? Yeah. And people don't really think about the fact that, you know, yeah. these people go to prison and it's like, you know, I did, did my dad do something bad enough that he didn't deserve necessarily to be in my life anymore? Mm -hmm. Okay. But did I deserve yeah. to not be able to speak yeah. to him yeah. because it was $14 for a phone call? Right. You know, yeah. I don't know that that's, you know, yeah. people have to think about those yeah. things. So I write yeah. about them and see what happens. Yeah, I think that's how it works. Who oh, else? Two more. Else? Okay. Do we have time for two more? Yeah. All right. Well, Excellent. I, I promise lightning round answers. Two more right here. I'm not answering. They don't let me I'm out much, so I have to talk <laughs> when I get out. Um, so, based on your personal experiences and your conversations with young people, what would you say are the most important factors for resilience? Mm. Besides, besides having a supportive caregiver, because that's like line one, right? Yeah. So, what? Yeah. I wish that uh, more middle class American families would let their kids fail at things. Um, you know, everybody, when, when, I, when I see every single kid on a soccer team, every single game or tournament getting a, a statue to go home with that gets thrown out in 10 years, um, I wonder that we're, we're sending a message that just showing up, you know, makes you win. Um, there's a lot, to, you don't, you know, letting the, the best thing that you can let your kids do is to fall down and make mistakes and flunk a class. I, like parents will get like so crazy about homework. It's like, let them flunk because you, you have to allow your kids, especially when they're in your home, to, un, to feel the consequences of their choices. Remove the emotional stuff. Remove your need for that child to go to Harvard. Um, allow them to experience consequences while they're home. 
so they can like go through the the dirt with you and 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 grow from that. Um, so failure is a wonderful teacher because um, you're going to fail more in your life than you're going to succeed. Um, also, I think honestly, for kids who um, whose bodies are are, are in a way that they can do this because some people have um, health issues that get in the way or mobility issues, but whatever kind of physical exercise we can encourage our kids to do because what you're doing then is that first of all it's great for your body but also then you're having this kinesthetic experience of pain and growth pain and growth injury and recovery that's what sports gives us um, and whether no one no, no seven-year-old is going to articulate that but they're going to have a lot of experience falling down and getting stronger and losing the race and running the next race so I would I would love to see I think there's a lot more we could be doing with that that was a longer answer than I promised I'm sorry but that's such a good question <laughs> and you have one I was wondering whether um, writing, speak, uh, was part of a recovery process for you and the ability for you not to write it for others but to write it for yourself, and whether your family knew and did they know when, when the, while you were writing it and then when the book was coming out? So um, my parents never understood. Like, I never told them. Because um, my mother still, my mother went to her grave thinking that I had a great time in high school. That's how delusional she was. Love her, love her as I did, but wow, man. Whew, those are some good pills, mom. Um, <laughs> but uh, so th- th- here's, here's what happened. I was attacked when I was 13. I didn't tell anybody for 25 years. At the 25 year point, that was when my oldest kid was turning 13. And I was like, and I looked at her and I realized I had so much stuff that I hadn't dealt with. And it's so, this is what breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that I and so many women and some men that I know, we can't often do what's right for us, just for us. But when it, we see that it affects somebody that we love, okay, now I'll go to a therapist. So I went to a therapist because I wasn't being a great mom. And, um, and the therapist was the first person I ever told. And the second person I ever told was my was my first husband, my starter husband, um, <laughs> who is you know, and I've been given the opportunity to remove his name from the dedication of the book over the years, and I've always resisted that because he's a great man, um, and he was a very good husband, and uh, probably a big part of our marriage failing was my trauma and inability to trust people. So that was sort of all that emotional work came and then came the nightmare that was the character of Melinda in my head. Um, And then the writing came out. So I think I had to go through that emotional work with the therapist um, and 25 years of of holding my breath. And then I opened the gates um, and the story poured out. Whew, thank you guys so much for being here. Take a yes. deep breath. Thank you so much. It's uh, Thank you. Yeah. Lori, thank you so much.